Good, okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الذين كفروا لن تغني عنهم أموالهم ولا أولادهم من الله شيئا وأولئك وأولئك أصحاب النار هم فيها خالدون مثل ما ينفقون في هذه الحياة الدنيا كمثل ريح فيها صر أصابت حرث قوم ظلموا أنفسهم فأهلكت وما ظلمهم الله ولكن أنفسهم يظلمون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد ايفريون وانس اجين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته um couple of observations about the paired relationship between surah ali imran and surah al baqarah before it the two large surahs of the quran that are back to back next to each other uh, the first half of surah al baqarah deals with the israelites uh, an address to the Israelites, and there's a there's an interesting correlation made between them and the Munafiqun of Medina. So there's that that kind of conflation made between them, uh, and it's also interesting that in Surah Ali Imran, the first half uh, is actually concerned with the life of Jesus and a conversation with Christian missionaries with them. So there's a well, on the one hand, you know, in the Fatiha we saw Ghairil Maghdubi alayhim wal Dalin, right? And in one of the uh, hadith reported. In a tafsir of that, al-maghdub alayhim is an indication towards the behavior of the Israelites, and al-dalin is towards the, the Christian people. And now you have the first half of Baqarah dealing with al-maghdub alayhim, and the first half of al-imran dealing with al-dalin. There's also another interesting difference between them, in that Allah is describing Banu Israel as people who know, they know something to be true, and they are uh, deliberately hiding what they know. And even after the light came to them, they are still choosing a corrupt path. So multiple times in Surah Al-Baqarah when he criticized them, he mentioned this phenomenon on, on how they were aware and they still went the wrong way, delib- knowingly. They did, this, they did so knowingly. And when it comes to uh, the Christian uh, doctrine, Allah seems to describe how only a few of them know, but the majority of them need to be told what the true story was. In هَذَا لَهُوَ الْقَصَصُ الْحَقِّ This was actually what happened. Right, so they're being, they've got confused ideas and they're being corrected. What's interesting about that in the context of our discussions is in Surah Al-Baqarah, the first example you saw was of the light being, you know, the, the fire being kindled. And then people, you know, they were waiting to light this fire. They were, you know, they were eager to light this fire. And then blindness came, which is being kind of, it's kind of, it, it goes alongside the crime of the Israelites. On the flip side here, you saw in the beginning, you, you get to a mathal, but the mathal is about Isa alayhi salam being like Adam alayhi salam, which is about clearing a confusion. It's clarifying a confusion. That's, that's the emphasis here. And this is actually the, the approach Allah takes with Banu Israel as opposed to the Nasara, uh, the, the Jews versus the Christians. The way the Quran converses with them is actually very different. And you can notice that difference even in the way the two parables in the opening are in the two halves of these surahs. The second half of Surah Al-Baqarah also, and the second half of Surah Ali Imran are very interesting because Surah Al Baqarah, the second half, is the early instructions on Sharia and it's also preparing the Muslims for Badr. So, the first battle in Islam. Before the battle, they were given preparatory ayat, and part of that preparation were the ayat that were revealed in Surah Al Baqarah. So, it's, you, could see, you, you could call it, for simplicity's sake, pre battle commentary. It's pre battle commentary. What happens in the second half of Ali Imran is Uhud has already happened. And Allah is now going to comment not pre-battle but post-battle. So he's, there's post-battle commentary in Uhud. It's also an interesting contrast because there's a victory in Badr and there's massive loss in Uhud. Even though there's recovery later on, there's still massive loss as we all know in Uhud. And it's almost equal in weight. Seventy of the great leaders of Quraysh were killed in Badr and pretty much 70 of the most important Sahaba, many of the most important Sahaba were Shuhada in Uhud, right? So it's actually, you know, in, in Yamsaskum Karhun, Fakad Masal Qawma Karhun Mithlu, right? So if, if uh, an injury has touched you, an injury has touched those people also, 
right? وَتِلْكَ الْأَيَّامُ نُدَاوِلُهَا بَيْنَ النَّاسِ And these are the days we flip between the people. So some, sometimes the kuffar will get the victory, some days you will get the victory, and there's a purpose for their victory, and there's a purpose for your victory. Right, so that's, that's a side note. But I wanted to bring that to your attention because what Allah does in His surahs, in the Qur'an, is sometimes He will actually, it's like looking at two surahs, is almost like looking at two sides of a coin. It's you're, you're completing the picture by looking at them together. And one of the ways that these two complement each other is we talked a lot about the examples and the parables on spending in the path of Allah in Surah Al-Baqarah. We saw the believer when they spend is like a seed that explodes and 700 and multiplied by 700 into infinity. We saw that. that then we saw the spending of the munafiq. The one who spends either for the wrong reason, الناس, or they spend and they impose that and talk about it later and expect favors later on. So they had something was wrong in their mindset, and that's basically the sending, spending of the munafiq. So the spending of the mu'min is described, and the spending of the munafiq has also been described. But if you look at the opening of Surah Al Baqarah, there were three groups there was the mu'min, there was the kafir, and there was the Munafiq. So there's one group left whose spending is not yet talked about. So the, if the spending of the believer has been talked about, and the spending of the hypocrite has been talked about, whose spending has not yet been talked about? The kafir. So you find in Surah Ali Imran, where this is 116 and 117, kafaru No doubt about it, those who've disbelieved, their monies, their, all their kinds of assets and their children will not be able to benefit them against Allah in any way. وَأُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ And those are the people of fire, هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ In which they will remain forever. مَثَلُ مَا يُنْفِقُونَ فِي هَذِهِ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا The example of whatever they spend in this worldly life. The example of whatever, who, who's the they? The word they is a pronoun, it goes back to the earliest noun. The noun is in the previous ayah, those who disbelieved. الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا So, the, the example of disbelievers who spend in this life. You see now that's the third case, right? The believer, the munafiq, and now the kafir, been put here. Uh, Allah says, كَمَثَلِ رِيحٍ uh, the, the spending in this life is something like wind. كَمَثَلِ رِيحٍ Like a wind. فِيهَا <laughs> سِرٌ In which there is, uh, now sir can have multiple meanings, we'll dive into that, but for now we'll say in it there is a freezing, freezing biting cold. So there's a wind that has a freezing, biting cold in it. أَصَابَتْ حَرْثَ قَوْمٍ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ It struck the crop of a people that had done wrong to themselves. So these people have a farm, they have a crop, and a freezing wind came, and it struck that, that area. فَأَهْلَكَتْهُ And it destroyed the entire crop. وَمَا ظَلَمَهُمُ اللَّهِ And Allah had not done them wrong. وَلَكِنْ أَنفُسَهُمْ يَظْلِمُونَ However, they're doing wrong to themselves. Okay? Now there's some really interesting subtleties inside of this ayah, but we're going to take them one bit by bit. First question is, who is this talking about? The immediate, there's two answers of the Mufassirun. I believe both of those answers deserve attention um, in, in uh, interpreting and understanding this ayah. I told you this is about Uhud, right? So what happens is, the kuffar lost in Badr. Now they're angry. And some of their, you know, the, the, the women back in the day when you, when you lost a battle and you, the soldiers who survived came back with the dead bodies of their comrades, the women who've lost their husbands, fathers, brothers, whoever, they start nagging and crying and saying, what kind of men, what kind of men are you? You're not going to take revenge? What can, you know, and they're, they're, they're just constantly shaming the men who come back from battle. This was part of the culture. And they would, now there's this collective rage in, in Mecca. We have to have revenge. We've got to take revenge, right? We underestimated these, you know, these exiles because they basically kicked them out from Mecca to begin with, right? The Muhajirun. So they knew that they're powerless people. What are they going to fight? What, what are they gonna, and then they lost, in, they lost against an army that was a third of their size. So this was, they underestimated the enemy, right? Uh, you guys don't watch movies, so I don't know how to explain this to you, but sometimes there's a big, there's somebody who underestimates their opponent and then they find out the hard way, right? That happens in, in kafir movies that other people watch, not people in Manchester. I'm not in Oldham especially, Oldham Sharif. Okay, so, so they found out the hard way that they took a beating. And now they're like, oh, we're not gonna, we're not gonna be blindsided ever again. We're gonna be ready the next time. We want revenge. So now they're putting in more money, rebuilding, 
They're going to build a much stronger army. They're going to come back. By the way, they came with a thousand in Badr. They're coming with about three to four thousand in Uhud. So now they've not only have they lost people, but they've now put in three, four times the expense to build this next military and come back again for more, right? So they've, they've done quite a bit of spending on this. And they will continue to do spending even into the future because now they're taking this campaign, this threat of Islam that has now come to bite them, they have taken this threat seriously, they will annihilate this problem once and for all. They have, that, they have blood in their eyes. They had arrogance in their eyes in, in Badr, but they have blood in their eyes in Uhud. You understand? So they're, they're, it's, it's a different mindset. So now when they come, there's, there's another problem too by the way. So whatever happens in, in Uhud, you guys already know. So I won't review the battle of Uhud, that's a story by itself. But one thing you should know is Muslims, at the end of it, when all is said and done, Muslims did suffer some very heavy losses, right? So we're injured, basically we're injured, right? But it, we're not, we haven't been killed entirely. So the Quraysh do leave, but they know that we are not in the strongest position now. So actually one of the final post episodes of Uhud was, the Quraysh left and then some of them thought, man, we should have finished the job. This was a good time to finish the job. We, maybe we should turn back. And while they're picking up their dead, and they're crawling back home, and they're not expecting it, we should come back and just wipe them out. And according to some Sira reports, Rasulullah found out that that's what they're thinking. They're thinking about coming back. So the Prophet told the injured, demoralized, in a sense defeated Muslim army, get up, we're going after them this time. Before they come after us, thinking we're down, we're going to go after them. And this is commented on towards the end of Ali Imran. And the, the Muslims got ready, even though they are, you know, they, 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 they responded to Allah and the Messenger even after injury had touched them. And, and jarh or jurh in Arabic is an injury. But qarh is an injury that goes all the way into the bone. Right? That's called a qarh. So Allah is saying they were deeply wounded. And they still got up and said, the Messenger says, go, so we're going. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? When the Quraysh found out, oh, 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 they're coming? Okay, you know what? Next time. So they. They ran off. So the Muslims showed up where they were supposedly camped out, but you know Abu Sufyan and the rest had left by then, and the, and the battle didn't happen. But this was an interesting test of faith also. Regardless, the Quraysh now see an opportunity. The Muslims have been hurt. They've been financially devastated because war is expensive. And it's especially expensive for the side that loses. You should note that when people owned a sword, that was not a small thing to own. When people owned a shield or a body armor, that was like two, three generations of life savings. That you got one of those things. So that, you know, when you read like, oh, they only had 20 swords or this many horses, or, that's because it's really expensive. Really, really expensive stuff. And when you lose in battle, the enemy comes and he takes the swords and the shields and the armor from the dead soldiers, because that's their spoils of war. We call them anfal, right? We, we gain the anfal, they gain the anfal. So they, they left with that stuff. So they know the Muslims are right now economically, materially, you know, in terms of weaponry, they're weak. They're weak. So the, the Quraysh are, even though they've left, they're like, I don't know if we want to give them enough time to regroup and strengthen themselves. Maybe we need to come up with a plan to finish this for good. Even though we couldn't finish it immediately, we shouldn't wait too long before we end this problem. Right? And that is the precursor to what happens not too long after, which some of you might know as the Battle of the Trench, Al Ahzab. And this time the Quraysh are like, okay, we came with four times or three times as many. We couldn't finish the job. And actually, they almost lost, and they know that. They're like, it's going to take a lot more than us to do it. So they went to other tribes and they said, hey, join us. The problem is, if you're going to convince somebody else to join in a war with you, you have to give them a really good reason. All these other tribes, they're not enemies of Islam, they don't care. They, they don't really care, they have, no, they, they have no skin in the game. But when the Quraysh go to them and say, hey listen, we, this time we're not going into a battle, we're going to go into their city. We're going to kill everyone. And this is, they're, they're, not, they're weak right now, they're recovering right now. So if we get them right now and we go into the city and do this mass genocide, go after the civilian population, that's going to be a lot of property and a lot of easy money, and a lot of slaves. 
This is easy, easy money for you. And especially if you are with us, you know who we are. We're the big dogs in the neighborhood. They're the Quraysh. They're the big, big ones. So when they use their credibility to sell, to make this pitch, to make the, 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 the United Nations of, or the United Tribes to come against the Islamic threat of Medina, the others are interested because this is easy money. And you, you should, I mean, you probably already know, the Arab tribes, a, a huge majority of them were like, you know, they were into robbing and pillaging and, you know, getting, you know, uh, this wal mughirati subha is part of the culture, right? They, they, they rob and pillage. So this was a pretty good opportunity and it's coming from a really credible investor. Quraysh are themselves putting skin in the game. So they convinced a bunch of tribes to get together and now the army that's coming after the Muslims is multiple times bigger than even Uhud. This is in the tens of 10,000 plus now. We're, we're dealing with massive numbers now, right? And they're not looking into a battlefield, they're looking to come into the city and invade the city altogether. That's what they're trying to do, right? And that happens not too much after. Regardless, this ayah is actually before all of that. What I'm trying to tell you is, now they had more incentive to spend even more, and to invest even more. And they convinced other tribes to also invest. Because coming out into a military campaign is an investment. All of what Aisha shared with you is to explain one thing. When Allah says the example of what they spend in this worldly life is a comment on the enemies of the Prophet ﷺ who were spending whatever amounts of money, you know, money, horses, you know, uh, weaponry, you know, food, supplies, logistics, whatever they were spending to end Islam, to deal with the problem of Islam. They were investing to annihilate, to eliminate Islam from the region. That's what the commentary is about. So that means, if we understand that, then until Judgment Day, there are going to be campaigns, well-financed, well-funded campaigns. Some of them will be media campaigns. Some of them will be educational campaigns. Some of them will be social engineering campaigns. Some of them will be military campaigns. Some of them will be economic policy campaigns. But all of those campaigns will be designed to eliminate Islam in some way from society. How do we get Muslim youth, more and more of them, to become atheists before they get out of college? I was in uh, Pakistan not too long ago, and I was talking to some young kids in Karachi at a dinner, and they had gone to a private school in Karachi, right? Their parents could afford the, the tuition, so they put them in like these high-level schools, and the higher-level school means you got white people teaching you, that's what that means. You got, you got, they had American teachers, British teachers, etc. That's what they had. And every one of their American teachers was ex-military. And half their education was a, like showing that the Prophet ﷺ was a liar. That, in Karachi. And the kid held on to his faith even going through that school. He goes, you know, the, my entire, up until my ninth, 10th grade education, all I heard in my school, all from my teacher, is all these accusations against the Prophet ﷺ and why Islam doesn't make any sense and why it's a lie. And, like you wouldn't even get, you would have to consume hundreds and hundreds of hours of anti-Islam propaganda on YouTube to get the kind of indoctrination that was being provided by parents paying full tuitions to, to give, give them good English, right? And that's what they're getting. And he survived, the kid survived that indoctrination. You know, he didn't fall into it. You know, he held on to his faith, but he goes, most, most of my peers don't. I met kids in Muslim countries that I won't name, including Pakistan, other countries I went to where girls, little, you know, they're 13, 14 year old girls. And they're, I said, what's the hardest thing about, you know, your age? What's the toughest thing about, you know, well, it's wearing, praying. What do you mean praying? You're in a Muslim country. Yeah, when you, if the only girls who pray in the school are the ones that get made fun of. In a Muslim country. We're not talking about here. We're not talking about Australia or America or Canada. We're talking about the Muslim world. There. <coughs> it's a huge problem for a young girl to put on a hijab. All her friends will make fun of her. Even the teacher will make fun of her. In a Muslim country. That didn't happen on its own. This, you know, being ashamed of who you are, being ashamed of your religion, considering your religion backwards, wanting to be like the colonizers and who came and robbed you not even a century ago, and your, your greatest desire in the world is to be one day the, the, the greatest coconut you can be, right? That's, if, where did that come from? That's, it didn't come on, your, on its own. There are billions spent 
into creating that kind of psychological, social engineering and indoctrination. Right? That, it doesn't happen on its own. You know? It's not automatic. It's not on autopilot. There's a campaign. They call it in America, we, our military calls it the hearts and minds campaign. What that means is blow people's brains out and shoot them in the chest. Is, they call it hearts and minds, right? <laughs> you know, but that's, you know, bring, bring our media, bring our, bring our uh, you know, uh, our policies, you know, it, especially infiltrate the university campuses, go after that. To me, the real battlefield for Islam is actually the college campus. That's the real battlefield for Islam. And not even college campuses in the non-Muslim countries. The college campus in Muslim countries. And Muslim, that's the real battlefield. Who's caring about those youth? We're, we're thinking we should bring them to the masjid. Bro, they're not even thinking about Islam at this time. They're, they're on a different planet because investment is being made into them because when they graduate from college, they're going to be the ones that are going to be running the companies, they're going to be the ones that are going to be working in government, they're going to be moving and shaking in society. If we, can gut, if we can rip Islam out of them, then Islam will be gone from society within 20 years. Good plan. It works. You know? And here we're thinking the, the real cause of Islam is everywhere else but college is fitna. No, no, no. College is the battlefield. It's the ideological battlefield. Right? And they're pouring money into it. So now come back to this ayah. مَثَلُوا مَا يُنْفِقُونَ فِي هَذِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا There's another interpretation of this that the Mufassirun offer. And that interpretation is, this is talking about all disbelievers. Because disbelievers, even if disbelievers do something good, that doesn't count for anything. But I, I want to qualify that for you, so, so you to understand that properly. You see, p people like uh, you know, Abu Jahl, Right? He insults the Prophet ﷺ, he's at war with Islam, he's defiant against Allah. It's possible he takes care of some orphans too. It's possible. It's possible he's also very generous with some people in his family. Very possible, right? <coughs> You'll have um, people that are criminals, right? They're part of like drug gangs and all of it, but they take care of uh, you know, their neighborhood. And they take care of the old lady's groceries from, the, from, the, from around the block or whatever. They're doing something good. And one of the reasons they do something good is something inside them tells them, man, I do some pretty messed up stuff. But because that messed up stuff is probably going to lead me to hell. I better do something to put in the credit. that say, hey, I was messed up. But look, that old lady though, I got her some cereal the other day. Right? So that should count for something. And it eases their conscience. I'm not all bad. Oh, you think I'm bad? Let me show you how bad I am. Grandma, you know. So yes, I've killed many people, I've done this, I've done that, but you know, I take care of that too, I do some good too. And in their mind, morality is like a transaction, right? So okay, I do sins that weigh this much, I'll do some good things, it'll counterbalance it, it's all good. Yes, you know, uh, uh, we expelled uh, uh, Muhammad and his followers. They're not going to say sallallahu alayhi wa We will say sallallahu alayhi wa well, We expelled those people, we kicked them out. But look at how many people we take care of also. Look at how much we provide also. Look at how generous we are also. Right? We take care of all the hujaj. They used to be proud of taking care of the hujaj even in the days of shirk. We're, we're proud of that too. And so the commentary would then mean that if you are fundamentally on the side of evil, and then you happen to do some good too, you happen to do some good too, then that good and is not that different from the money being spent against the cause of Islam. That good isn't actually any good at all. It's similar to another place in the Quran where Allah says, وَقَدِمْنَا إِلَى مَا عَمِلُوا مِنْ عَمَلٍ فَجَعَلْنَهُ هَبَاءً مَنْثُورًا Well, we're going to approach whatever they did of any even good deed and turn it into dust that gets scattered. That's all it's going to be. Now let's look at the analogy that Allah is giving. He says the, the example of what they're going to spend or what they continue to spend in this worldly life. فِي هَذِهِ الْحَيَاةِ dunya. This فِي هَذِهِ الْحَيَاةِ dunya has two implications too. First of all, they're, they're spending right now anyway, so there's no reason, reason to mention that. Right? Because Allah says whatever they spend, obviously nobody's thinking they're spending in the Akhirah, we're immediately thinking they're spending in dunya. So what's the point of saying فِي هَذِهِ الْحَيَاةِ dunya in this worldly life, in this closest life? It suggests that they are immersed in worldly life. It suggests that the only reason they spend is they cannot think anything beyond this worldly life. Every expense they're doing, every investment they're doing, they're hoping for a return on investment here. The, the expense is here, the return should be here. This is directly in contrast with what we saw in the spending of the believer. Right? 
Allah said, وَمَا تُنْفِقُ مِنْ خَيْنٍ يُوَفَّ إِلَيْكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تُظْلَمُونَ It will be given back, whatever good you spend, it will be given back to you, you will not be wrong. But that's not necessarily in this dunya, that's the akhirah. For these people, everything is here. They're entirely immersed in the now. مَثَلُ مَا يُنْفِقُونَ فِي هَذِهِ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا كَمَثَلِ رِيحِ It's the example of a wind. And now I'm going to set the stage for you for what's happening in this, in this parable. You see, um, when you're going to farm, you have to choose the land carefully. Because you cannot just farm, you can't just grow any kind of crop in any kind of place. There are certain kinds of plants that grow well in certain kinds of climates. And you have to, if you're buying land to get into farming, then you have to know what kind of crop you're going to grow and will that crop survive in this region. Or if you showed up to a place like, you know, if you go to, for example, uh, in, in the, I, I'm more familiar with the U.S., so I'll give you a U.S. example. If you go to Michigan, uh, in the in Midwest of the United States, if you go to Michigan in the summer, or you go to Michigan in the, uh, in the spring, it's actually a really pleasant summer. It's a really nice spring, right? And you're like, this is a great place to be. I think I'm going to set up over here. Uh, if you go to Michigan in the winter, uh, you're, you're, you will feel the freeze. If, if the breeze comes and hits you, you'll feel it inside your bone. It's like the wind goes through your body. It's that insanely cold. I mean, I've seen cold. I used to live in New York, not Michigan cold. That's a, that's a different level situation. Or, or Massachusetts in the United States. The one time I was driving Massachusetts, and my he heating messed up in the car. And I used, to have, I used to wear contact lenses, and they started freezing. The contacts started turning solid. And I was like, maybe I should take them off before they go bad. I opened up my contact lens solution case. It was ice inside. I was like, <laughs> I'm not coming back here. <laughs> but if you go to the same place in the summer, it's beautiful. My goodness. It's night and day, completely different place. It's, it's, it's life in the summer, it's death in the winter. The same way where I live in Texas, winter's pretty nice. Don't go there in the summer. <laughs> don't, don't go. You know, it's not a place to be. Now imagine some people who decide, oh, this is a great place to grow our crop. This looks like a really good place. And they never wondered about what's going to happen in the winter. What kind of winds come here in the winter. So they, they decided to invest into the farming exercise, but they invested in the wrong place. This is in Arabic called وَدْعُوا شَيْءٍ فِي غَيْرِ مَحَلِّي وَدْعُوا حَبَّ فِي غَيْرِ مَحَلِّيهَا they, they put the seed in the wrong place. This is not the climate for that kind of crop. The definition of وَدْعُوا شَيْءٍ فِي غَيْرِ مَحَلِّيهِ in Arabic is ظُلْم When you put something where it doesn't belong, it's called ظُلْم Keep that in mind because we're going to see the wording come up in this ayah. Right? So that's one way you can understand this imagery. Uh, you know, they, they had this crop that they were trying to grow and all of a sudden a freezing biting cold wind chill came through you know and the the, the sir in arabic it can be used related to sar sar which is intense wind sir was also used as an as an adjective rihun baridun sir so barid is actually cold or bard but if it's biting cold, then you add an additional adjective, which is sir. So sir itself doesn't mean cold. It's barid or barid, that means cold. But it got used so much that just if you say biting winds, you didn't have to say biting freezing winds. So the, the word sir kind of started carrying the implication of freezing cold, even though linguistically it doesn't mean freezing cold. It got associated with the freezing cold. So now, as it starts coming, Allah says, أَصَابَتْ حَرْثَ قَوْمٍ It's interesting. Asaba hu abilun, right? We saw over and over in asaba, asaba ha i'sar fi hinar. Now he says asabat hartha qawmin. The same language. It's almost as if he's connecting it with the with the use of these words. He's connecting it to the parables that came in Surah Al-Baqarah. All those ayat ago in Surah Al-Baqarah. So now he says it struck the crop of a people. This nation. This this. Um, this wind struck the crop of a people. It's in it, there is this freezing, biting nature. And when it came and struck the crop, now the crop is an interesting word because it's, it's kalima shamila. It's not just the harvest. It's actually, when you say, you know, this is their crop, it refers to the land, the seed, the plant, the whole operation. And the wind is so cold, it didn't just damage the plants. 
By the way, wind has to be, or the, the breeze, or the temperature has to be an extreme kind of cold to damage plants. But if it's even past that level of extreme, it can even long term damage the soil. So you can't even grow anything, even after the freeze is over, you can't even grow anything afterwards. And that's what it seems to be implying, that this w wind came and now this place is no good for crop. Nothing can grow here anymore. Asabat hartha qawmin. It, it, it destroyed the crop of a people. That wind came and destroyed the crop of a people. Now what did I tell you? The Quraysh were interested in spending a lot for revenge for Uhud. But after Uhud, they got really interested that there's an opportunity to get everybody together and destroy Islam, come into Medina. Remember that whole story? Watch this. Allah says, مَثَلُ مَا يُنْفِقُونَ He didn't say, مَثَلُ مَا أَنْفَقُوا He didn't say the example of those who spent. He said the example of those who spend and will continue to spend. He's talking about the future. This ayah is after Uhud. It's after Uhud. So Allah is not talking about what they already spent to win Uhud. Allah is talking about what they're spending now and what they will continue to spend. Their campaign isn't over. So Allah is already letting Muslims know, by the way, they're putting more money in and they're going to come after you again. Very subtle. Then Allah said, مَا يُنْفِقُونَ in the previous ayah you saw, لَن تُغْنِيَ عَنْهُمْ أَمْوَالُهُمْ وَلَا أَوْلَاءُ Their money and their children, which I'll talk about in a second. But in this ayah Allah says, the example of whatever they spend, whatever they spend, as if Allah went from a very specific description, their money, their children, but now He said whatever they spend, which is interesting because they're going to go to multiple tribes and who knows what each tribe is bringing. There's a tawassu in the meaning. There's also a tahqeer from Allah. It's as if Allah is saying, doesn't matter what they spend. Whatever they spend is just whatever, it's nothing. So he's, he's, it's like throwing sand at a, at a castle, hoping it'll fall, like what are you, you going to do against Allah's plan? So they bring all these armies together, these tribes together, and they're coming after Medina. How did Allah describe their loss in Medina? Allah says, فَأَرْسَلْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ It's so beautiful. فَأَرْسَلْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ رِيحًا وَجُنُودًا لَمْ تَرَوْهَا he said, we sent against them a wind and armies you couldn't see. You remember the trench that Sulaiman al-Farsi had dug? They made their camps outside. They can't get through, right? So they're setting up. By the way, when a military is set up outside in a camp, they don't have endless food supply. They don't have endless water supply. They've got to keep getting deliveries for the food and the water because it's going to keep running out. They don't have kitchens and things like that. They have to make fires and cook right there outside. That's the, the life of a camp. Now a wind comes, a fast wind comes, and some of the horses get so disturbed, they run off. They get untied and they run off. The camels get disturbed. Some of the pots that were cooking flip over. The, some of the tents start uh, going on fire. And then the fire is spreading and the animals are going crazy. And, this is happening because Allah sent what against those armies? Allah says, Allah sent against them winds. And then He says, armies you couldn't see. It's pretty interesting that in this ayah Allah says, the example of those who will continue to spend in worldly life is the example of a wind that will strike the crop of a people that had done wrong to themselves. <laughs> so, so powerful. They had done wrong to themselves. This is another rem remarkable phrase in the ayah. They had done wrong to themselves. They thought they did so much damage to the Muslims in Uhud. And Allah's commentary on what wrong they did, Allah could have said, you know, ظلموا المؤمنين, they wronged the believers. Could have, could have said it like that, right? ظلموا nas, they wronged people. Or ظلموا, they wronged, they did wrong. But He said ظلموا anfusahum. actually they were doing wrong to themselves. They were damaging themselves, they were digging their own hole. What an amazing way to describe the, the overpowering enemy that is coming at you and Allah is already describing that these people, miskeen, is just beating himself up. You know? ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ فَأَهْلَكَتْهُ And it destroyed all of it. What's also re remarkable about this ayah, and you know, inshallah soon we'll talk about Ahzab too, the examples are coming in the future, inshallah, in this month, hopefully we'll get to that, po uh, that point in our, in our journey. Uh, there are lots of examples in the Qur'an, I want to go in Mus'haf order as much as possible, inshallah. Um, I'm not intending to cover all of the examples, I don't think that's possible in the month of Ramadan, but whatever's left over, push it to next Ramadan, inshallah. So that's the, that's the intention. But anyway, so, فَأَهْلَكَتْهُ وَمَا ظَلَمَهُمُ Allah Allah says, then it destroyed that crop and Allah is not the one who wronged them. Allah didn't wrong them at all. 
why is this happening to us? No, no, that was you. Walakin, and it's interesting, other places in the Quran you'll find, Walakin kanu anfusahum yazlimun. But they used to wrong themselves. Here Allah didn't say that. He actually pushed this into the future too. Walakin anfusahum yazlimun. However, they wrong and will continue to wrong themselves, is a commentary about what's coming. So, Muslim, it's so cool that in what, what happened in Badr, after we won, after we won in Badr, Allah told us in Surah Al-Anfal, prepare yourselves. A'iddu lakum. He didn't tell us after we lost, He told us this after we won. A'iddu lakum masata'atum min quwatin wa min ribatil khayy. The same way we just lost. And He says, be ready, they're coming. I'll deal with that, but you should know they are investing. They haven't stopped because you're not dead yet. But what's going to be dead is all of their investment. Fa'ahlakathu. I'm reminded with this, what I'm reminded of is what Allah did with Fir'aun. You know, Fir'aun's biggest problem became Musa alayhi salam. He became such a huge problem, and he became a PR problem for him. Because what happened in the castle with the snake and all of that, with the python, what happened was the word spread in Egypt that the Pharaoh, who calls himself God, got scared of a snake. And he got terrified, and he had to back off. So he's looking pretty bad. So he had to create an entire campaign of the magicians who will defeat Musa. He didn't say Fir'aun is going to defeat Musa. He was spreading the campaign that the magicians are going to defeat Musa. But that wasn't enough. He, had to, he didn't just need to destroy Musa alayhi salam. He's just killing one man. That's not a big problem for him. He needs to destroy the image. And the only way to destroy the image is to create the largest convention Gather everybody. وَقِيلَ لِلنَّاسِ هَلْ أَنْتُمْ مُتَّبَعُونَ Are you coming or what? Get, forcing people to show up, gathering these magicians, paying them lump sums of money, setting up a day with great festivities, يَوْمُ zina. You would imagine the greatest convention ever held in the history of Egypt, يَوْمُ zina. All so they can undo the damage already being done by Musa alayhi salam, in this grand show, the whole nation can watch in one time. And what happens? The people that he paid top money to, to stand by him, who started their, they started their show with بِعِزَّةِ Fir'aun. That's how they started their demonstration. By the glory of the Pharaoh. That's how they started. And by the end of that demonstration, they're doing sajda to Allah. And they're telling the entire crowd, we believe in the, the master of Musa and Harun, right? You know what Fir'aun did? Fir'aun paid for the biggest da'wah convention in Egypt, in the entire history of Egypt. <laughs> That's what he did. فَأَهْلَكَتْهُ وَمَا ظَلَمَهُمُ اللَّهُ وَلَكِنْ أَنفُسَهُمْ يَظْلِمُونَ By the way, I, I, I'm giving this away, Ahzab, they collected all these tribes, right? Their motivation was destroying Islam. But the other tribes didn't care. What did they care about? What did I tell you? What did they care about? They cared about money. They just wanted to make money. And they only went for it, because anytime you go into a fighting venture, it's a risk, it's a high risk venture. The only reason they went for it is because Quraysh have credibility. When they are camped outside for weeks, and they can't make any money, and then the winds come and destroy all of their investment, and they go back empty handed, what just happened? Quraysh lost its credibility. Quraysh lost it. They cannot get, convince those people to stand by them again. They, they lost. The first problem of the Quraysh, the, 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 you know, the downfall of Quraysh actually starts with Ahzab. That's the first downfall. And the, the, what's happening in the seerah from then on is the next domino, next domino, next domino. But all of those dominoes are actually a net result of this biggest campaign. What they spent the most on is the one that destroyed them the worst. That's what destroyed them. فَأَهْلَكَتُهُ It destroyed it. It destroyed the entire investment. They weren't able to, Allah didn't wrong them. Um, but rather they were doing, they're continuing to do wrong to themselves. May Allah Azza wa Jal help us appreciate the, the power of Allah's plan. I don't say rhetorically like, you know, pounding the table and saying, and the kuffar can spend whatever they want. They will never be able to dis defeat Islam. And then you're like, Takbir! I'm not giving you one of those speeches. That's not, that's not what I, I'm not interested in, in, in hyperbole. You know what I'm interested in? Allah gave victory to Muslims when they were on their mission. And when the Muslims are on their mission, then whatever the kuffar spend, 
doesn't do anything. It's not a free ride. The kuffar can do whatever they want, you will win anyway. Don't worry, because you're so special. No, we're not that special, unless we act special. The believers have to, t to emulate the behavior of the believers, then the victory from Allah is guaranteed. So what sometimes we do is, we take these guarantees of the kuffar losing, right? And we feel good about ourselves, like a placebo, and we, th we assume there's nothing to do on our part. Like we're already doing our part, mashallah. It's just now we're just waiting on Allah to just bring the freezing wind. Let's freeze these assets, right? <laughs> so, and that's the, that's the empty kind of emotional rhetoric that I want us to get out of. We, I, we want to become honest with the word of Allah when it's pointing at the kuffar in a critical way, we, we take that. And when it's pointing at us in a critical way, we take that also, right? And so this, this, is, this is why I don't want you to just feel like, oh yes, this is us coming. No, well, may Allah make us worthy of those winds that come against the enemy, right? And it's also interesting that Allah says, وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَ In this surah, لَا تَهِنُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Don't worry, don't be saddened, don't feel weak. You will be on the very supreme position if, in fact, you truly are believers. If, in fact, so now if we're not in the supreme position, then maybe we need to check where we stand in terms of our iman and what that iman requires of us. Right? That's because the byproduct of that is antumul alone. That's the byproduct. May Allah just give us a correct understanding of this book and make us committed to its guidance and, our, and its teachings. And may Allah just destroy the plans of those who attempt to hurt or to, to take away the deen of Allah from this earth because we know their plans will always fail. And may Allah make us of those who bring the victory of this deen to this earth because if we don't do it, Allah doesn't need us, we, we need Him. إِن تَتَوَلَّوْ يَسْتَبْدِلْ قَوْمًا غَيْرَكُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَكُونُوا أَمْثَالَكُمْ If you turn your backs, Allah will just replace you with another nation that's not you, and they won't be like you. Meaning they won't be losers like you, they'll actually do the job. Right? So we're, we're, we're dispensable. We've been honored with Islam, but that doesn't mean we're indispensable. You know, we're not some special race. The only thing that makes us special is the iman in our hearts. May Allah Azza wa Jal preserve that iman, strengthen that iman, and allow us to cultivate generations upon generations that, that live and die by that iman. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum everyone. There are almost 50,000 students around the world that are interested on top of the students we have in studying the Quran and its meanings and being able to learn that and share that with family and friends. And they need sponsorships, which is not very expensive. So if you can help sponsor students on Bayina TV, please do so and visit our sponsorship page. I appreciate it so much and pray that Allah gives our mission success and we're able to share the meanings of the Quran and the beauty of it the world over.